So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to knock out the first blank right now. So if you're following along, let's just go ahead and address this directly. First blank is this. We don't talk about sex enough. Here in the body of Christ, thank you, we do not talk about sex enough. Uh, Here we are, we live and exist in this hyper-sexualized society, right? And I'll tell you what, everybody else is talking about it all the time, right? You see it everywhere. It's used from billboard advertising to commercials. Netflix streams it all day. And if you have a 10-year-old boy in your house, he knows exactly how many taps it takes to get to it and to convince you that he doesn't know anything about it. Yeah, it's all over the place. It surrounds us, and Satan is talking about it all the time. Why don't we? So today, I want us to really deal with this directly if we can. I know the knock on the church is that we are, you know, sexually repressive, you know, that we really try to make sex out to be bad, you know, and and the Bible, frankly, has some harsh language around our sex lives when conducted improperly. I was a youth pastor for years, and I, I remember how we talk to teenage girls about their sex life, right? Sex, it'll ruin your life. It's dirty. It's gross. Save it for your husband, Right? I mean, somehow we, we have this thing that we do where we kind of don't really know how to deal with it. The Apostle Paul is talking to the church at Corinth, this deviant church that got a lot of issues in the church, and he directly confronts sexual issues, and he's pretty stern about it. I mean, he actually tells the church, look, if you've got unrepentant sexual sinners in your church, you got to get them out. You've got to remove them from your church or everybody around town is going to know you as sin church. So he's really stern about this whole deal. Why is it that it feels like we're so down on sex all the time? Jesus was asked a question from the Pharisees about marriage and divorce. And I think Jesus' answer to this question helps us see where this all started so we can understand where it may have all gone wrong. So Jesus is traveling on the road and the Pharisees come to him in Matthew 19 and they tried to trap him with this question. Here's their question. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? I, I'll, I think it's really interesting how they're very concerned about the men's rights to divorce. Should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And I love Jesus' response. He looks at these Bible scholars of the day, these religious leaders, the Pharisees, and he says, haven't you read the scriptures? <laughs> All right, so Jesus says, haven't you read the scriptures? They record that from the beginning, God made them male and female. And Jesus is pointing back to something much bigger than their issue. They want to talk about the issue of men's rights to get rid of the women they don't want. But Jesus doesn't jump right into their immediate issue. He starts by pointing back to the beginning. He literally points back to page one and page two of the whole story. He continues and he says, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife and the two are united into one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. So he addresses their issue But he points back to the core. He points back to the beginning. He shows who God has made us to be first, which will help us understand where everything goes wrong. We're going to talk about this a little bit in our life groups this week. I I told our life group leaders I didn't want to lob the awkward bomb of, you know, little old ladies sitting around with tea talking about sex. I just thought that was weird. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what Jesus says about divorce in our life groups this week. 
But on this marriage and divorce issue, Jesus points back to the beginning. He points back to the ideal, right back to how God started this blessing in the first place. He points back to Genesis 2. Let me look at the uh, actual original Genesis here. Uh, It says, this explains, this is what Jesus says. He's quoting Genesis. It explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. The two are united into one. And look what's going on in this context. God puts the man and the woman together in the garden, and the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. What do you think is going on here? Come on, what do you think is happening here? It's a naked young man and a naked young woman having fun. It's an all-time garden naked party. (laughs) Can I get an amen? Amen. That sounds pretty good to me. Doesn't it sound pretty good to you? So that's what's going on here at the beginning. I mean, God has, remember, God has created the man in his own image. He's like God. And he let the man go to sleep. He put the man to sleep, and and he removes a rib from the man. And from the rib, he fashions, God fashions a a woman. And he presents the woman to the man right right there in the garden. And here these two naked people are standing, facing each other. For the first time ever in human history and here's the man's response in Genesis 2 23 he says at last the man exclaimed this one is bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh she will be called woman because whoa man right because she was taken from man. I mean, I think Adam is recognizing the incredible, intense, beautiful blessing that God has just bestowed upon him. What I want us to see today, that I think Jesus wants you to see, that sex is a gift from God. And first, next blank on your page, sex is good. Can I get an amen? amen? Sex is good. God created it to be a blessing, to be fulfilling, to bring joy and happiness into your life. Sex is good. Here's the preacher saying it. Sex is good. And the Bible is totally comfortable with that. You, you hear me? The Bible is okay with that. Amen. I, I know. Thank you. There you go. I know that a lot of us think that talking about sex on a Sunday morning may not be an appropriate topic for church and all, but that is not a biblical stance because the Bible is for sex in your life. In fact, there's an entire book of the Bible that is devoted to sex poetry. Did you hear me? It's all about love and sex in Song of Solomon. In fact, that book gets pretty graphic, but it opens with this beautiful love poem of the young woman here's what she says kiss me and kiss me again for your love is sweeter than wine how pleasing is your fragrance your name is like the spreading fragrance of scented oils no wonder all the young women love you take me with you come let's run and then the poem closes with the king has brought me into his bedroom. The scripture affirms the joy and the beauty and the exhilaration of sex. In fact, when Paul is talking to the crazy sin church in Corinth and he's correcting them about their sexual sin, he also writes to them, same church, same letter, and he encourages married men and women to have sex often. If I'm ever going to get help in a sermon, <laughs> men, it ought to be this one. I mean, I know y'all, ba- all you can do to stay awake most of the time, but here's what the scripture says about having sex often in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, the husband should fulfill the wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. See, babe, it's in the, it's in the Bible. It's right there, honey. I mean, somebody, somebody just found their new life verse. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. And then it kind of extends the thought, do not deprive each other from sexual relations. Honey, I just want you and me to be obedient to God's word. (laughs) 
Amen. I just, want, I just want us to be faithful to God. I mean, I just, I have God's heart for uh, us in this. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. And he goes on and he says, but as soon as that time is over, come back together again. I mean, he's explicit about this. In other words, if you're married, next blank on your page, biblical sex is frequent, fulfilling sex. Biblical sex, come on, Joe. Biblical sex is frequent, fulfilling sex. I, I, I was really hoping you guys would help me out a little bit more, but I have never seen men take notes harder than I am right now. <laughs> you're writing this down. Circling, got it. Circling the verses. <laughs> So the Bible is for you having sex. And I know I go, to, I go to your homes from time to time. I get into people's homes and I see around your house. We all have these, you know, our favorite aspirational, you know, statements on our walls about how, you know, God wants us to live. We're blessed, you know, or we have our favorite proverb, you know, our favorite proverb or our favorite verse hanging on the wall. Let all that you do be done in love. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. You know, I, I think that's all great. But, you know, I've never gone in someone's house and found my favorite proverb hanging on the wall. Let your wife be a fountain of blessing for you. Rejoice in the wife of your youth. She is a loving deer, a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you always. May you always be captivated by her love. What, why don't we have that hanging? Come on. Amen. Come on. Thank you, God. I don't know why we don't have that hanging in our house all the time. So at the end of the service, I'm going to auction off. <laughs> Did you notice the background picture, by the way? <laughs> huh? Yeah. I'm just making sure. Okay. All this to say God is for you. And he's for your sex life. He made it for you. And it's good. Can I get an amen? amen? It's good because if you'll remember the whole idea of this message series, that marriage mirrors the gospel, right? Marriage mirrors the gospel. God's drawing a picture of something bigger and better in your relationship. That picture is a gospel picture. The gospel tells us that you and I were separated from God, right? He's holy and just. He's perfect and pure. Uh, he, he's righteous. Everything he does is right. God is love. God is truth. And we hate that about God. Scripture tells us that in our, in our fleshly nature, we hate God. We are rebellious, treasonous criminals against God. And we love our stuff. You know, we love, we love what we love. We love what makes us good. We love our issues, you know. We, wanna, we love ourselves. And that makes us enemies of God because we love the things he hates and we hate the things that he loves. So we're separated from him and the wages of our sin is what? It's death. So we gotta pay for who we are and what we've done. But God sees us, we talked about this last week, God sees us through the eyes and the lenses of his son Jesus who came across that great chasm right to us. And he became like us, not hateful against his father, but he became flesh and dwelled among us. And then when it came down to it, God took everything I'd ever done and he blamed Jesus for it. He put it onto Jesus and Jesus paid the price that I owed. Jesus paid the debt that I could never pay. Jesus died for my sins in my place, cold and in the grave. But three days later, he rose again, and now he lives in and through me and you. If you're a believer, he lives in and through you to unite you with his Father. You're now in this lifelong covenant relationship that is never going to be broken because Jesus has done everything necessary to make that relationship happen. Can I get an amen? Amen. 
So that's how marriage mirrors the gospel. Amen. That's how marriage mirrors the gospel. It's a covenant relationship not to be broken. And boy, it comes with passion. It comes with the blessing of sexual passion. Thank you, Lord. But there's some principles that we can learn about our sex life and not necessarily look at some, um, you know, sexual phrases and verses in the scripture. You know, I think about someone in the Old Testament who was passionate and not in a sexual way. I think about Moses. Because Moses, he was passionate about his people, wasn't he? I mean, he loved his people. He led them out of Egypt and into the wilderness and made sure for 40 years, made sure they had everything they needed, took care of them, made sure they had a relationship with God, that they were good with God. And he took them all the way up to the promised land. He was passionate about his people. I believe he'd always been passionate about his people, right? So the scene happens many years before they're rescued out of Egypt. Many years before the crossing of the sea and the you know, desert and the Ten Commandments, you know, and all that. Many years before that, Moses was raised as an Egyptian while all the Hebrew people were enslaved in Egypt. Right? He was raised as an Egyptian. And, and one day he's out walking around and he's, I, I think he's probably praying. I think he's probably developing a heart for his people, developing a passion for his people. And he's watching how his people live in Egyptian slavery. And in my mind, it's burdening him, it's hurting him to see how harshly, how badly they're treated. And in one instance, he sees an Egyptian slave master ruthlessly beating one of his Hebrew kinsmen. And this angers Moses. And so Moses, he gets so mad about it, he commits a crime of passion, right? You probably know the story. He looks around, Exodus 2, he looks around in all directions to make sure no one was looking. And when he saw no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. Moses has a good thing passion for his people but Moses misplaced his passion he applied it in the wrong way and here's the next blank on your page misplaced passion is disastrous when you take a good thing a passion and you put it in the wrong place it can destroy your life am I right when you take something good that God's given you, but you, you put it where it doesn't belong, it can really mess everything up. So my question for you is, what are you doing with your passion? What, what, are, you, what are you doing? How are you applying your passion? You see, I think that we think, we all think that we're good, right? We're, we're totally good on all this because in this day and age, you know, um, I can delete my browser history. And nobody knows what you're binge watching on Netflix. And she hasn't seen those text messages. I use a separate app for that. Right? And no one, no one, no one knows about the romance novels you got stuffed in the drawers all around. We think we're good. We think we've buried it in the sand, so we think we're okay. And we're living kind of a false sense of security. But look what happened to Moses, Exodus 2, 13 and 14. The next day, when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. He says, why are you beating up your friend? Why are you fighting? Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who started the fight, and the man replied, who made you the judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Here's what I want you to see. Just because you buried your indulgence doesn't mean it won't come back to bite you later. Just because you've deleted your browser history, just because you think no one's watching what you're watching, just because you think nobody can see what you're really thinking, talking about who you're talking to, just because you think your spouse can't hear those inappropriate conversations you're having at work, you think you've kind of covered it up, you think it's kind of buried in the sand, but it can still come back to bite you right? That's what we do. That's what we do is we scoop the fire up and we put it in our lap according to Proverbs 6. Can a man scoop up a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? 
Why are you playing with fire? When I was a youth pastor, I always used the illustration like this and hope it'll connect with you just a little bit. God gave us a wonderful thing. He gave us our sex life. It's like a fire. I love a good fire, don't you? I mean, I love on a cold night, like we've had some cold nights this season. I love on a cold night to, to sit in front of a roaring fire. In fact, we, we've had the thing before, we'll just kind of camp out in the living room right there at the fire. It's just fantastic. I love the fire. It's warm, makes me feel really warm. Crackle in there. I just love staring at the flames sometimes. You know, it gives you that calm sense of peace. Man, it's just fire right there in the fireplace. It's just a blessing in your life. But let's pretend that I like the fire so much that I want it a little bit closer to me. So I take, I scoop up the fire out of the fireplace and I put it right here with me on the easy chair. And I'm just like, hey, now it's right here with me. I've got the fire right here in the easy chair. Is that a smart move? No, because listen to me, listen to me. Your sex life was designed by God to be in the right place. And when you misplace it, when you take it out of the fireplace, as good as it is, as warm as it is, as much as it blesses you in the fireplace, when you take it out of the fireplace, it will burn your house down. Can I get an amen? It can destroy your life. That's why Proverbs says, can a man scoop a flame into his lap and not have his clothes catch on fire? We're playing with fire. We are all the time playing with fire. And we've become adjusted to it where we think it's totally okay. I remember one time before we lived in LJ, uh, we lived kind of in the suburbs down a little bit closer to Atlanta. And my son and I were out in the yard all day um, blowing leaves. Just It was fall and we were just trying to get all the leaves. And we had a really long yard. And my son was uh, like, I don't know, about 13, I think, at the time. And uh, he had been out there with me and we'd just been clearing the yard, clearing the yard. And I wanted to burn these leaves off and get it over with. Just get, burn them off, tired of them. Right? So in the way back, in the back part of our yard, I already had this large pile of sticks, you know, the stuff that falls out of the trees, you know, just sticks around and everything. We had had a storm and there's been some down limbs. So I just had this pile of wood kind of sticks just, you know, all out there. And I said, Zach, let's, let's, let's blow all these leaves up on top of the up on top of the sticks and we'll just burn it all it'll all just burn real good okay dad so we start blowing it on there and blowing it on. I'm like hold on hold on I want this to be over fast so I went and I got a gas can and before there were leaves all on the sticks you know I just I just poured the gas around on the ground and on the sticks right there you know okay it's good go ahead and blow go ahead and blow all the leaves up on the sticks and so he's like all right I put the gas can you know way far away because I'm not stupid and so he uh <clears throat> So he blows all the leaves up into a big pile on top of all the sticks. I'm like, okay, we're going to burn this real fast and, and get it over with. And uh, good, good. Okay, so he turns the blower off, and I'm, he's like, Dad, Dad, can I start the fire? And I was like, well, sure, you're 13, sure. So you just strike, just strike the match, drop it, and back off real quick because it'll roar up pretty quick. And I'm standing over here by the gas can, you know, 15 feet away. I'm like, yeah, go ahead, this is fine. So he leans over this thing. And he lights the match, and my prayer life changed. If you ever want to know what an explosion of the flames of hell is going to look like one day, my son disappeared into it. I mean, it wasn't like that thing where you light the liquid gas and it roars up. We had been... We had been aerating that thing so that there was full, it was full of fumes underneath those leaves. And when he dropped that match, it was, I'm not kidding, it was boom! So loud that it shook the house. Sherry comes running out. And I, my first thought, literally my son disappeared into the explosion. And I'm, I thought, oh my goodness, I've just blown my son up. It's over. And fortunately, he was okay. He was like that you know, thing at the end, like... <laughs> and he was fine, you know, he was okay. But looking back at it now, of course, I have to wonder, idiot, what were you expecting? What were you thinking was going to happen? You've been playing with fire, pouring gas on it, 
and letting the fumes all build up under those leaves. What did you expect with that thing? Of course it's going to explode and have its way with you. Men and women, that's what you're doing all the time. Ladies, when you are watching The Bachelor, you are watching pornography for women. I'm convinced. I am, because what you're watching is you're watching the best looking guy they could find take out all the women on a network budget. Your man's never going to live up to that. It's created this false impression in your mind. When you're streaming Bridgerton, it's an eight hour sex movie. Don't tell me it isn't. And it's free with your Netflix account. And you're watching that, and I promise you, you are playing with fire. You're building up an image of something that your husband, that your significant other can never live up to, so you will one day go looking for it somewhere else. What did you think you were doing? Men, as you're dialing up that pornography that you're watching, you really quickly forget that what you are watching are heavily made up, carefully lit and shot actors who are portraying sex acts that can't even happen in real life. It doesn't work that way. And you know it until you've watched a bunch of them and then your brain gets rewired so that you don't see a wonderful, beautiful creation of God in his image in front of you. Now all you can see is a woman who can be exploited for your pleasure. What did you think was happening? I know there are lots of millennials, married couples today, and they're unable to enjoy the blessing of sex in their marriage unless they can conjure up the image from the porn that they've been watching. Don't ruin your life that way. What did you think was happening? My challenge for you, believer, husband, wife, is to fight hard to, last blank, keep the fire in the fireplace it's good in the fireplace it belongs in the fireplace that's where it was designed to be for you don't let it get out and ruin your life can i get an amen on that god we